Well, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, and we dealt with some foundational truths last week. We're going to deal with some more foundational truths this week. Uh, before we go and talk about some of the areas that often are the source of contention, you know, the, the baptism of the Holy Ghost and, and tongue speaking and the gift of the Holy Spirit, what, prophesying all those things, what is that all about? I think it's important to lay out the groundwork and deal with some uh, specific things about the Holy Spirit. So last week, we dealt with the personality of the Holy Spirit. If you remember, I mentioned that there are three things that make up personality or personhood. What are the, those three things? Do you remember? There is, um, anybody remember? There is the mind, right? Will and emotions, okay? And so the mind is the, the ability to have knowledge, to retain knowledge, to give knowledge. The will is volition, um, to make a decision, to do something. And then the emotion, obviously, is when we looked at the, uh, at the Holy Spirit, is that He can be grieved and He can be lied to. And so there is personality there. And uh, we find that to be true about the Holy Spirit. This morning, I'm going to deal with the, the deity of the Holy Spirit. All right? The title of the lesson this morning is, The Holy Ghost is God. The Holy Ghost is God. So I've made that statement, and I'm going to see if the Bible backs that statement, all right? So let's look at, uh, we're going to begin this morning in first, or 2 Corinthians chapter 3, if you're turning your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Uh, I want to read here a, a good portion of this chapter. We're going to begin reading in verse 1, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. As I mentioned before, when, it come, when we come to Bible doctrine, you'll find in many uh, denominations and churches that often they'll hand everybody a book, and they'll say, okay, this is what uh, we believe, and so what we like to do as Bible believers, is to say, all right, here's what the Bible says, and just write from the Bible. Uh, we don't have a catechism, in the sense that our catechism is the Bible, the Word of God. And so we want to get our answers right from uh, the Word of God. And, uh, you know, we live in a, there's, there's two things about Bible doctrine. Obviously, there is, seems to be a, a disinterest in Bible doctrine. That's both true in those who sometimes come to church, they're not interested in doctrine, often they're more interested in experience. And then there's a problem with those who are teaching. They said, you know, well, doctrine is not interesting, and I beg to defer. It's very helpful, most helpful, as a matter of fact. And um, most of Paul's epistles are comprised of two main aspects. There is a, a doctrinal treatise, and then there's practical living. And most of his epistles are divided those two categories, and, it, and he always begins with doctrine which shows us, as he's writing to those churches, if you're going to live in a specific way as Christians in this world, you have to get your doctrine right. And if your doctrine is not going to be right, then your living will not be right. And so doctrine is important for that. Uh, and um, um, so let's, let's consider here 2 Corinthians chapter 3. I want us to read this chapter. And again, the do this is the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, I guess, part 2. But notice here, let's begin reading in verse 1. Do we begin again to commend ourselves, or need we, as some others, epistles of commendation to you, or letters of commendation from you? Ye are our epistle, written in our, uh, written in our hearts, known and read of all men. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the, epistles, uh, the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God. So he, he's talking to these churches, you, you are our epistles. Uh, notice, this is the epistle of Christ. In other words, you're, you're Christians. You're the epistle of Christ. But notice here, this is not written with ink. right? It's not a physical thing, but with the Spirit of the living God. Now, he's going to compare this to something else. Notice throughout this chapter. Not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. Now, what is he comparing that to? What would you think? Tables of stone, what is that? The Ten Commandments. So here, there's a, right, that was letters. That was a physical thing. He says, but our epistle, we're the epistles of Christ, the believers at Corinth, the epistle of Christ, written, notice, not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God. Let's continue reading verse 4. And such trust have we through Christ to Godward. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, 
but of the Spirit. So here's that theme again. Not letter, but the Spirit. For the letter killeth, that's the law, but the Spirit giveth life. But if the ministration of death written and engraved in stones, referring back again to the Ten Commandments, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? For if the ministration of commendation be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excelleth. For if that which is done away was glorious much more that which remaineth is glorious. Now, obviously, he just talked about when Moses came down from the mountain and his face shone and people saw the glory. That was the glory of God, not the glory of Moses. And so uh, he's talking about the glory again, talking about the experience where they received the tables of stone written. He says, we have an epistle that is not written, but it's by the Spirit, verse 12. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech, and not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. But their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil, untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when I shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now, we understand what that means, right? Uh, when we trust Christ, that veil is gone. And so notice verse 17. Now, the Lord is that Spirit. Now remember, we haven't received a, an epistle written with ink. Right? He said early on in uh, verse 3, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God. And he says in verse 17, Now, the Lord is that Spirit, what the Spirit of the living God. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, but we all, with open, fa open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Now again, verse 17, the Lord is that Spirit. That's a direct statement. The Lord is that Spirit. We are we have an epistle written on our hearts, and it's written by, he says earlier in verse 3, the Spirit of the living God. That's the Holy Ghost. And he's compared the, this epistle written on our hearts, written by the Holy Ghost, uh, to the, uh, the tables of stone which Moses received. And certainly that was a glorious thing. God directly spoke to man, and there's glory there. But he says, but here we're talking about how we have the indwelling Holy Spirit of God, and he says that the Lord is that Spirit directly call it, calling the Spirit, of the, Lord, uh, the Spirit of God the Lord, just like Jesus Christ is Lord, and just like the Father is Lord as well. If you turn with me to one more uh, passage, 1 John chapter 5. 1 John 5. Again, I want to read this chapter. I think it's important here in both of those cases to look at, at the, the entire context as we think about the doctrine of, of the Holy Ghost. First John chapter 5, verse 1. Notice, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and every one that loveth him that begat uh, loveth him also that is begotten of him. But this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the, it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. Now notice here, who, who bears witness? The Spirit bears witness. This, because the Spirit is true. Now remember who taught this? Jesus Christ, John 14, 15, and 16. The Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, He is called, I think, three times the Spirit of truth. He bears witness. Verse 7, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, now we know who the Word is, 1 John 1, 14, 
the Word was made flesh, that's Jesus, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Now that's an important verse, and it's missing in the modern English versions apart from the King James Bible. Verse 8, And there are three that bear, record, uh, that bear witness on earth, the Spirit and the water, and, uh, and the water and the blood, and these three agree in one. Notice verse 9. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. Now, notice, the witness of God is greater. Who did he say was, who, who bear witness? Who is it that bears witness? The Spirit. Verse, verse 6. And so then he says, verse 9, If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. Who is the witness of God? The Spirit, the Spirit Himself is the witness of God. For this is the witness of God, which He hath testified of His Son. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in Himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of His Son. And so we find here those two passages um, uh, declare very plainly that the Holy Ghost is God. Now, in the second lesson in this doctrinal series, I, I addressed the doctrine of the Trinity. The word Trinity is not found in the Bible, but the truth is. We just say it's the doctrine of the Trinity to sum up what, what, what it means. But I made four statements in that lesson. That was the second lesson. I'm, I'm going to repeat the first three that I made. The first one, as Bible believers, we know that there is only one true and living God. Right? Only one true and living God. Uh, Deuteronomy 4.35 says, Unto thee it was showed that thou mightest know that the Lord, He is God. There is none else beside Him. So there is one God. That's what the Bible teaches. The second statement I made is that the one true and living God is a triune God. And we just read that in 1 John 5, verse 7. There are three that bear record in heaven. The Father... Um, the Word, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost, and these three in one, uh, these three are one. And so when we look at this statement, this is what it says. So the Father, that, that's one. The Word, that's one. And the Holy Ghost, that's one, right? So that's three. So one plus one plus one, what's the math? Equals three, right? Now, I know, I know you're thinking spiritually. You're young. I'm, just math. One plus one plus one equals three, all right? Here, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, these three are what? One. One, one two, three equals one. Now that's not my, that's what the Bible says right there. These three are one. So the one true and living God is a triune God. We don't worship three gods. We worship one God. There's only one God. But He is a triune God, manifested as the Father, the Son, and uh, the Holy Ghost. And then I made another statement, and that is that this, it is this, that God has worked on behalf of man as Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. When Jesus Christ gave the Great Commission to His disciples, He told them this, Go ye into all the, all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, baptizing them in the name. What name is that? The name singular of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Three, three names. No, no, one name. Why? Because it's one God. But He has manifested Himself to man as Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And so, you know, the Bible says in, in John 1, uh, 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 12, but as, many as received them, uh, but as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. And there it is, all three of them right there. Who do we receive when we get saved? The Holy Ghost. In other words, as many as receive Him, who come in and dwells us? The Holy Ghost. To them gave He power to become the sons of God. We become the sons of who? God the Father. Even to them that believe on His name, whose name do we have to believe in in order to be saved? Jesus Christ. So as many as received Him, the Holy Ghost, to them gave He power to become the sons of God, the sons of the Father, even to them that believe on His name, the name of Jesus Christ. So we say this, 
those who have believed in His name, Jesus Christ, the same have received Him, the Holy Ghost, the same have been given power to become the sons of God. So, uh, Christ is received, uh, or Christ is believed, the Holy Ghost is received, and then we become adopted into the family of God. So, again, and this is all scripture, right? Uh, John 3, 16, who do we believe in to be saved? Jesus Christ. Who do we receive at salvation? Well, the Holy Ghost. Our bodies is the temple of the Holy Ghost, uh, which we have of God. We are not our own. We are bought with a price, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Uh, stated again, uh, when Jesus Christ taught His disciples in John 14, He says that the, whole, the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, He will be in you and with you. And then we also understand that we have a relationship with the Father. Romans 8, 14 says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of, a, uh, of, of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby ye cry, Abba, Father. For the Spirit beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And so, it is by Jesus Christ that we are saved, by the Holy Ghost we are sealed, and by the Father we are adopted and accepted. So that was the three statements that I've made. I'd like to deal with some basic things, I guess, dovetailing off that second lesson, and here's the first one. First of all, because again, the lesson is the Holy Ghost is God. So first of all, what we know in Scripture is this, that the Holy Spirit is God as seen in the identity the Scripture gives Him. So in other words, if, if the Holy Ghost is God, that means that the Scriptures, if we're going to make that statement, the Scriptures has to identify Him as God. Because if the Scripture does not identify the Holy Ghost as God, then we can't say He's God. And so, does it identify Him as God? And so, as we compare Scripture with Scripture, we clearly see that the Holy Ghost is indeed God. Uh, we're going to turn to, uh, let's see, three passages of Scripture here and um, make a comparison. All right? So, who'd like to go to first Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8 through 10? All right, Mark. Then let's go to John 12, 35 through 41. All right, Ray. And then Acts 28, verse 25 through 27. All right, John. So um, we know the scene in Acts chapter 8, before Mark begins here, reading those few verses, right? Isaiah saw the glory of God and high lifted up. His train fell to the temple. What, 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 uh, uh, what do they say about uh, the Lord high and lifted up? Holy, holy, holy. So that's what Isaiah saw. And uh, notice what he said. Uh, so Mark, Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8 through 10. Okay, now, the voice of who, who is speaking? The Lord. The Lord is speaking, right? And when He speaks, He... Well, what's the question that you just read? Whom shall I send? Whom shall I send? All right, let's keep reading. Uh, then said I, Here am I, send me. Uh, and He said, Go and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of the people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert, and be healed. Uh, then said I, Lord, how long? And he answered, Until the cities be wasted without inhabitant, and the houses without man, and the land be utterly desolate, and the Lord have removed men far away. And there be a great forsaking in the midst of the land. But yet in it shall be a tent, and it shall return and shall be eaten as a healed tree and as an oak. All right, that, yeah, that, that, that's good. So notice back in verse 8, if you have your Bibles there, Isaiah hears the voice of the Lord, and notice what the voice says. Whom shall I send? The Lord is speaking. And then he says, who will go for, what's the next word? Who is speaking? The Lord is. But he says, who will go for us? Who's us? Okay, now, in the New Testament, that passage is quoted quite a bit. Um, and two of those references is found, one in John 12, 
Uh, let's see here. Ray, did you have that? Who had John 12? You're right. Yeah, right. So, Ray, John 12, verse, read verse 35 through uh, 41, and uh, with a special emphasis on verse 41. All right? Then Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. While you have light, believe in the light, that you may be children of light. These things spake Jesus and the Okay, so here, notice, Jesus is speaking, and then there's a narrative. These things spake Jesus, right? So the narrative of John here is, this is what Jesus said. Go ahead, keep reading. Um, these things spake Jesus and departed and did hide himself from them. But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. That the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report, and to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, because that Isaiah said again, He hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. These things said Isaiah when he saw his glory and spake of him. Okay, now, he quotes several portions of Isaiah, right? And he said that Isaiah quoted those things concerning Christ. And notice verse 41. These things said Isaiah when he saw his glory and spake of him. Who we're talking about? Jesus. So what did Isaiah see? Who did he see when he saw the Lord? Well, here John 12 tells us he saw the glory of Christ and he spake of him. That's who the narrative is in John chapter 12. And so when the Lord says, uh, whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Who's there? Well, the Lord is speaking, but who is present there according to John 12? Jesus Christ. That's who is there. So that's John quoting Isaiah. He saw the glory of Jesus Christ. Now, let's go to Acts chapter 28. And um, I guess read verse 25 through 20, 27. So, he quotes directly from Isaiah 6. Okay, and as he quotes, he's preaching, and as he quotes from Isaiah 6, he says this, Well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophets unto our fathers, saying. So who spoke? The Holy Ghost did. So notice, in the New Testament, when you think about Isaiah 6, right? Isaiah sees the glory of the Lord. The Lord says, Whom shall... I send, and who will go for us? And then we read in the New Testament that what did Isaiah see? Well, he saw the glory of Christ. Well, who was speaking to him? Well, the Lord spoke to him. Well, the Bible says that the Holy Ghost spake. You see, why are those three back referring to the Lord who, who spoke? Because those three are one. It's one voice. But three, speaking, one voice, so three in one. And so we find that uh, clearly in the scriptures here. And so as we compare this one event, Isaiah chapter 6, and go to John 12, and go to Acts chapter uh, 28, then we find and we reconcile those scriptures together, and we find the truth there. Let's consider another truth, and that, and that is this, the one who was provoked by Israel. Now, uh, let's look to uh, several passages here. Who would like to go to Exodus 16? Exodus 16. Now, all right, James, and then Psalm 95, all right, um, Joe, and then Hebrews chapter 3, Mark. Uh, all right, so let's look here at both uh, or all three of those passages, and um, when Israel was provoking the Lord, what, what, what it says? So uh, Exodus, if you read verse, let's see here. Verse 7, Exodus chapter 3, uh, 16, verse 7. 
in the morning, uh, then you shall see the glory of the Lord, for that he heareth your murmurings against the Lord. And what are we that ye murmur against us? Who are they murmuring against? The Lord, right? Uh, that throughout the chapter, you see that repeated again and again. They murmured against Moses, uh, against Aaron, against the Lord. Okay, so that's that's pretty clear, right? So they were murmuring against the Lord. We know the whole narrative. Oh, we had it better in Egypt, and it's like, now oh, sometimes you're like, do you, do you need a reminder, you know, of what it was like? Well, while you were in Egypt, you were enslaved, you were beaten, and, and you had it better there. Uh, and so they murmured against the Lord. Now let's go to Psalm 95. Joe, did you, is that the one? Okay, so Psalm 95, read, um, let's see here, read verse 7 down to verse 11. So Psalm 95, verse 7 through 11. Yeah, so he's referring back to the murmuring, right, of Exodus chapter 16. And here again he mentions that, uh, the, the, the narrative here is, um, ye saw my works, you provoked me to temptation, so God is speaking, right? That, that's Psalm 95. So this is what Israel has done against me. Now, let's look at one more passage, and that is Hebrews 3, Mark if you want to read verse 7 down to verse 11, and I, I might pause you right there, so you know, bear, bear, bear with me. All right, so Hebrews 3, verse 7. Um, Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, Today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation and the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me... Okay, so pause. Who said, who is speaking? The Holy Ghost. As the Holy Ghost said, and he directly quotes Psalm 95. And then notice the last part that Mark just read, when your fathers tempted me, who is speaking? The Holy Ghost. Who were they tempted? Well, the Bible says Exodus 16, the Lord. Who's the Lord? The Holy Ghost. Uh, keep reading. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works 40 years, Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation, and said, They do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. All right, so the you notice, so the Holy Ghost said, and then they've tempted me, they proved me, they saw my works. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation, they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath. Who's speaking all that? The Holy Ghost. So we make the conclusion by comparing Scripture with Scripture. Exodus chapter 16, Psalm 95, Hebrews, here uh, chapter 3, that again, confirming the statement I made at the beginning of the lesson, the Holy Ghost is God. That's why we begin in 2 Corinthians where the Bible says, the Lord is that Spirit. Let's look at one more. Uh, this will be good under this heading here, that the Holy Spirit is God as seen in the identity that Scripture gives Him. Let's think about this one, is that the, the Holy Spirit is the one who inspired the Scriptures. Now, two passages here. Who'd like to go to Jeremiah 1.9? Jeremiah 1.9, John, and then uh, 2 Peter 1.21, 2 and James. All right, so, um, yeah, it's tough where with all those Bible names. I have turned to books, and then John, and James, and Mark, and uh, it's, it's getting tough around here. <laughs> Matthew, too. I mean, we got all the names of the Bible around here. So, uh, yeah, so Jeremiah 1 9. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said unto me, Behold, I put my words in my mouth. Okay, so the Lord touches Jeremiah, and the Lord says, I've, I've put my words in your mouth. So that's the Lord, Jehovah God. He puts his words in the mouth of Jeremiah. That's the Lord. That's a direct reference to the Almighty God. 
Now let's look at James, 2 Peter 1.21. Okay, now, what did that be referring to, James, there? The prophecy came not in old time. What is that referring to? Uh, the prophecy of uh, the coming Messiah. Yeah, the coming Messiah. And, and we could say, right, the, the entirety of the Old Testament, right? And so, particularly, we could say, you know, the prophets who prophesied about Christ, but obviously he's referring back to the Old Testament. And so, the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. We just read in Jeremiah that the Lord put his words in the mouth of Jeremiah. And keep reading the rest of the verse. Okay, so the Lord says, I've put my words in your mouth. And then Peter says, well, th this, is, uh, this is how the Lord put his word in the mouth, because the Holy Ghost, they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So, so who put the words in the mouths of men? Well, it's the Lord. Yes, it is the Lord. It's the Holy Ghost. You see, we don't make the distinction between the two. Uh, and so the doctrine of the Trinity is affirmed, right? We've looked at the doctrine of the Trinity, then we talked about Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. And we also know that the Holy Ghost is God. Uh, it is evident in the Scriptures. Um, let's, uh, let's move on. So the first point was that the Holy Spirit is God as seen in the identity that Scripture gives Him. One passage, it's the Lord. The other passage, same passage quoting, says that it's the Holy Ghost speaking. It's the Holy Ghost doing this. So those are one, just like 1 John 5, 7. There are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. And so now we're, we're, we're understanding that statement, that it, it's three distinct things, the, the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, but they're one. It's, it's one. That's why Isaiah 6, uh, the Lord speaks and He says, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? So it, there, it's interesting. He didn't say, whom will we send and who will go for us? He, there's the singular and then the plural in the same question. You see that? Why? Because it's one God, but three. Three and one.